The 2020 primary elections are here with Iowa voting last week and poll voters going to New Hampshire this week. The Democrat primary is in full swing, as is a fight for the core and soul of the Democrat Party. Where do these candidates stand? Who's going to win? And what does it mean for the Democrat Party? John Cole, the managing editor of Politics PA, joins us to break down those issues and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm your host, Sam Chen. The Democrat primary for the 2020 election is in full swing. The Iowa caucus occurring last week and voters in New Hampshire heading to the polls this week with Nevada, South Carolina and Super Tuesday right around the corner. But the Democrat primary isn't just a fight to see who's going to be their nominee. Many have cast it as a fight for the heart and the soul of the party. Different visions for the future of the party. Different visions for how to govern. What does that all mean for the Democrat primary as they head to November and as they head into the, this election cycle? John Cole is the managing editor of Politics PA. He joins us again this week to help us break this down. John, welcome back. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for always having me back, Sam. It's always good to have you. This is a huge topic uh, that, that's talked about here or there, um, but it, it's, I think it's something that's on the back of everyone's minds at least and is kind of there in all the conversations, even if it's not outright spoken about. And it's the question of the Democrat primary not simply being who's going to be our nominee, but what's the future of the party? And, and this is any time that a presidential primary comes around, this is a question a party has to answer. Republicans did this in 2016. The Democrats, to some extent, did this in 2016. Mm -hmm. Some would say the Republicans have been doing it since 2016. Um, and, and the Democrats as well. And, and, and now in 2020, with the cameras on, prime time, all the candidates on the stage, mm -hmm. they are in the spotlight on this. Uh, I, I want to start by reading a quote from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Congressman Cortez is the youngest member of Congress serving right now. She was elected from the state of New York, uh, and she won in a contested primary against a sitting congressman, Joe Crawley. And in the recent interview, Ocasio-Cortez said, in any other country, Joe Biden, I mean the vice president and current presidential candidate, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party. This quote probably very well describes the, the not, I don't want to say fight, but the, the struggle within the Democrat Party for direction and for future. Talk to us, let's begin that conversation. Talk to us a little bit about what does uh, Costa Cortez mean here? What do you see when you look at the Democrat Party? I think there is, it's pretty certain that there's two different visions emerging from the party. I think you can make the case every single election cycle you're going to have your quote unquote establishment candidate who okay. doesn't want to ruffle feathers, who is, mm -hmm. has the D, maybe the DC insider who's been there a long time sure. and who's going to kind of toe the party line. And maybe they truly believe that. And there's always in each election, for the most part, there's that insurgent candidate who runs as the outsider, okay. challenges the status quo. Sure. So that person, that's nothing new. Correct, but okay. I think now it's being amplified where, um, I guess maybe you could say the label mm -hmm. on some of these candidates have changed now that there mm -hmm. are those who are outwardly saying they're democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a part of it. And as well as, um, I mean, both parties, like you said, I think in 2016, there was the conversation the Democrats happened in 2016 when you had Clinton versus Sanders. Mm -hmm. But Hillary was viewed as the favorite from day one and to the end, we kind of knew she from the beginning to the end, we knew she was the favorite, mm -hmm. and she ended up getting it. But it's interesting because since that day, a lot of the ideas that Bernie brought up in 2016, which were once viewed as maybe non-mainstream, are now much more adopted by the party. Sure. He talked about a $15 hour minimum wage. wage. He talked about other issues to candidates were, I guess, not heard of really. Mm -hmm. And now look at the Democratic Party platform. To a certain degree, the party has shifted in that direction towards the Sanders direction. That doesn't mean the whole party's there. Right. Because you look at that in 2018, this is really interesting, Sam. I believe this was New York Magazine, I had a story on it. And I know a lot of Sanders uh, fans are not a fan of uh, this story because they believe they're too critical on the more progressive candidates in 2018. Mm. Okay. But you look across the country, the Democrats took back the uh, you know, United States House of Representatives. 
And a big part of it was picking off those districts that are quote unquote Trump held districts. Sure. And they did that on the backs of candidates who were viewed as more moderate, not super sure. liberal candidates. We can even look at it here in PA. Let's bring it to the state right. for a second. There are three represent two representatives, excuse me, there's two representatives in Congress that represent districts that Trump won in 2016. Mm -hmm. Matt Cartwright up in Northeast PA mm -hmm. and Connor Lamb out in Allegheny County and I believe Beaver County. Mm -hmm. Point being, um, you know, to a Republican, you might say, oh, they're not, uh, you know, they're not anything close to a Republican, which is true, but they're not necessarily Bernie aligned. Sure. Both of those guys also endorse Biden. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like right, we could absolutely. see on a local yeah. level, and there are those in the party that think the party needs an overall shift towards the Bernie lane. They believe he has momentum sure. in his favor to a certain degree. Some of the party has adopted a lot what, it, what he was right. saying in 2016. But is it enough? I think the fear of the moderates, is it enough to keep on, hold on to these seats that are moderate districts? Sure. But then the counter point to it is, are young people going to vote for a sure. moderate who they may view as right. boring? Right. So it's definitely a fight in the party right now. And depending on who the nominee will be, we'll see how it plays sure. out because I think it'll have a down ballot effect. Sure. Because God knows every time there's a presidential election, even in off year elections, there's campaign ads of whoever's at the top of the ticket Correct. Correct. trying to tie them in. We saw it in 2018. Correct. Sam, let's talk about even in the Lehigh Valley mm -hmm. to the Philly suburbs where there was ads of Donald Trump's face was on every, every Democratic yeah. he ad. He was on the ballot. And he wasn't, and right. guess what? There was right. that effect. Right. And I think, who, depending on who the candidate will be at the top of the ticket for the Democrats, you're probably gonna see their face plastered everywhere. Sure. And maybe some of the more um, liberal progressive candidates, your AOCs and uh, such. Mm -hmm. But point being, it's definitely an ongoing discussion in the party. Will it all be answered in 2020? We don't know because it remains to be seen. Sure. But think about how different the Republican Party is in 2020 as it was in 2016. Right. Right. Pre-Trump, it's it's funny, you can almost have it as like pre-Trump and post-Trump. Post -Trump. Sure. And the parties change a lot. And the Democratic Party could sure. be on the cusp of that. Maybe they're uh, on the verge of embracing Bernie sure. and the more progressive ideas. That very well may happen. But we yeah. don't we'll have to see until sure. the primary plays out. Sure. Two things that you said I want, I want to hone in on. One, you, you talked about someone like a Connor Lamb or Matt Cartwright. They've both endorsed Vice President Joe Biden. They're both Democrats from Pennsylvania. In uh, otherwise, uh, it seems that voted for Trump, as you as you put it. They both did, yeah. Uh, and, and they both have some. They both have spoken outwardly about some of the fear of the more uh, Sanders type or, or the Alexandria Ocasio Cortez type. Toward that point, Speaker Pelosi had this, this comment somewhat infamously, uh, I think a year ago or so, when she talked about, to your point, that they didn't win the House back on the backs of the more progressive, self-declared socialist candidates. Mm -hmm. Sure, Ocasio-Cortez won a seat, a hard-fought seat that she earned, but she did it by defeating a sitting Democrat. There was a net gain of zero for the party. Mm -hmm. But that they won it on the backs of people like Connor Lamb. And, and I think Pelosi says something akin to this glass of water could run to her seat with a D next to his name and would win. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I think you look at something like that, but then also you know, your point of, the, as they say that, they've begun to adopt certain parts of the platform. If you look now at how many of these candidates support Medicare for all, mm -hmm. it's pretty much two, Sanders and Warren, support Medicare for all who need it, as Mayor Buttigieg calls it, is almost the rest of the platform. Mm -hmm. And you have maybe one or two, including Vice President Biden, who says, no, 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 I, I like the Affordable Care Act, I want to just improve on it and not move down a government-run health care system. Mm -hmm. But the rest of that 20-member presidential candidate stage does mm -hmm. support that. Does that sh what does that shift mean for people like Vice President Biden on one end and like Bernie Sanders on the other end? Again, I think it shows the, uh, I don't know if, I think a Democrat would maybe call it a real divide between ideas, you know? Maybe they don't detest the other Democrats or think the other sure. way, but it's just a fact of the matter is there's, I don't want to say there's two completely different visions, but it's notable that you have on the debate stage the Medicare for All debate mm -hmm. about, um, you know, having either, you know, uh, being able to opt into it or not opt into it, uh, you know, eliminating private insurance or not. Sure. Or putting a ban on fracking, which is a topic of conversation that will certainly play out in the state of Pennsylvania, depending on who the candidate will mm -hmm. be, because some of the more progressive candidates have talked about banning fracking. Some of them have said d different regulations to try to hone it in and make it safer, perhaps in those areas they think of, uh, I guess, fear of environmental mm -hmm. uh, reaction. But I think, point being, there's a big difference between talking about banning it and not banning it, Medicare for all, and then maybe building upon the Affordable Care Act. There's a real divide in the party, and I think 
I guess that's the thing that will be determined ultimately in this upcoming election. We're going to find out in these war of ideas who is ultimately going to come out on top. And again, if the if a Sanders uh, becomes the nominee, you would uh, you'd ultimately think right away that well, the party is certainly moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And maybe then the answer would be the momentum, and that's the momentum's there. So that sure. would be the answer. But for the time being, the next couple of months are going to be really interesting to see the future of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm because they could be going on a path of really changing. So sure. we'll have to say. I think you look at the Republican Party. 2010 was the rise of the Tea Party. 2016, obviously, the rise of Trump, which is still different from a pure Tea Party ideology, but that's led to this fracture within the Republican Party that's been played out on the national scene, right? We've seen the never Trump Republicans like your Rick Wilsons, your John Weavers, mm -hmm. and then you've got your Trump Republicans, and then you've got Tea Party guys like Congressman Lamosh, who leaves the party over Trump, even though he's a Tea Party guy. Mm -hmm. What can and should the Democrats, as they go through this process, in the national view, learn from what the Republicans did or what happened to the Republicans over the last decade? It's interesting because, again, I think as much as we could talk about this forever, but we genuinely don't know what's going to happen. I think sure. it'll be a topic of conversation without a doubt. It's actually going to be a conversation after this election, no matter what. Mm -hmm. I think there's still, I don't foresee, you know, the party just uniting around one idea. And I think to those in the Republican or Democratic Party, want their parties to be big tent. Yeah. They want people of different ideas to feel comfortable mm. within their party. Because if you only abide by a couple of things very strictly, then you're not going to, most likely you're not going to have majorities in the House, the Senate. When the presidency gets a lot tougher if you make a smaller tent. So I think there are Democrats out there that hope this doesn't permanently fracture the party. Sure. But it's definitely a type of conversation that's going to play out during the primary process, probably at the convention. And then in November, there's going to be, whether it's a more progressive candidate or a more moderate candidate, Whoever their candidate of choice is, if they don't win, you know that's going to be brought up the whole time. They're going to try to sway that person to more of their ideas. Sure. So or, or complain about some, some rigging with the system. Correct. I mean, we have not seen the end of this at all. This, this is just starting. You could say that. And again, like for the Republicans, it's been going on for, uh, a, you could basically say a decade. A decade, the Tea Party, absolutely. And Trump was a little different. Yeah. And then to those who are more loyal to Trump, they might deem those rhinos and yeah. things of that uh, nature. Oh, we've heard that how many times, right? Republicans in name yeah. only. But Democrats, maybe we'll hear more of the quote, maybe dinos. Dinos? Democrat, <laughs> Democrat name only. Maybe we're on the cusp of seeing that, so we'll have sure. to see that play out. But this is a pivotal year where that conversation is going to be brought up a lot. Yeah. In the national light. So, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you, John. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. John, thank you again for helping us break this down. Um, to your point, this is a fascinating time. Obviously, we look at the, the historic impeachment going on, but anytime parties go into realignment, there's history being made, and it's a fascinating conversation to be a part of. I want to go back to the quote we started with from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. And she said, again, she says, in any other country, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party. Uh, highly criticized, perhaps for being an election year quote, with the former vice president as, as seen as the front runner. But something you've raised before, she's not exactly wrong. If you look just again on the global scale of politics and government in other countries, uh, a lot of other countries don't just have a two-party system. Right. We talked about this as soon as we talked about this before the show. You had to think about it. Look, let's look at England. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of parties that go on there, you know, different parties in their system and uh, parties across the whole globe, really, right. where, you know, America is somewhat unique in the sense that there's the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. And, of course, there's a lot of people in this nation that don't necessarily align with both parties 100%. And right. that's worth noting. But at the end of the day, what are they most likely going to do? Yeah. Vote for either the guy or girl with the D next to their name mm -hmm. or vote for R. the guy or girl with the R next to their name. Most of the time, that's it. And especially in a presidential election, that's what you're doing. Very, very rarely do people vote for third party right. candidates. I mean, let's just look at even 2016. Jill Stein for the Green Party, right. Gary, Gary Johnson. Johnson for the Libertarian. They registered uh, numbers that were basically insignificant. Right. So point being, at the end of the day, even though they may not love everything the party says, they're going to vote for the person that's either a Democrat or Republican. So in that sense, Ocasio, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez isn't wrong. Right. But it's worth noting that in an election year, that may be viewed as maybe perhaps a divisive comment. Sure. That is that a sign that you're not willing to support him? You're basically saying you don't have the same ideas. Anyone in politics knows that Ocasio Cortez and uh, uh, former Vice President Biden don't see eye to eye on sure. everything. But at the end of the day, they're more alike than her and Trump would sure. be. So it's interesting to see that how big of a role will that play? Right. If she's saying that publicly, you kind of would wonder. 
Um, I wonder about the grassroots people where a lot of the momentum in the party is right. that support the more progressive candidates. Are they right. more willing to sit out sure. if their candidate of choice isn't the nominee, if it's more a more moderate person? We'll have to see, but that's sure. a, another storyline that we're 100% going to follow yeah. leading into the election. And to your point, John, I think it's the, and on the international scale, we see this a lot. Labor in, in Britain today is not labor even 10 years ago. The, mm -hmm. the Labor Party under Jeremy Corbyn is not the Labor Party under Tony Blair or, or, um, or uh, Gordon Brown. Um, and so you, you see this, sh this shift in parties. But in Britain, there are so many parties that all have seats in parliament, as, as in France, right? And so you see um, you know, the last two parties, Emmanuel Macron right now, and then Nicolas Sarkozy before him, part of two different parties. But then you do have the National Front with the Le Pens, and you have a, a wide range of parties that are prominent. That's very different from here. If the parties, and I, on the Republican and the Democrat parties in the United States, were to splinter out, what impact do you think that would have? I mean, certainly we see there are people like Ocasio-Cortez and, and Vice President Biden, two different schools of thought in the same party. There's people, you know, like uh, even like a congressman and former speaker, Paul Ryan, mm -hmm. um, in, in a very different vein than, say, President Trump or, or Senator Ted Cruz on the Republican side. How does that play out if that were to happen here? I think one thing that's worth noting that... Um Again, we're, I definitely agree with what you're saying. I think it's super unlikely in America, sure. just because look at the precedent that's been set. It's been, what was the last time we had a legitimate third party candidate? Uh, like we said, we talked um, about, I guess, what, uh, 92? Ross with, Perot. Uh, Ross Perot. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I mean, it's been a long time. That there's even a third party that was like really uh, a part of the conversation. So if it were to happen, it would be a big deal because we'd be seeing the end of the two-party system sure. in America. I don't think it's going to happen. But I think it's worth noting that these parties really do shift, yeah. where the Republican Party is without a doubt, and this isn't necessarily slamming or uh, mm -hmm. praising them, mm -hmm. this is just a fact that the party is not the same as what it once was in 2014, sure. 2016, pre-Trump. Look at the people who were speaking negatively about Trump in their own party during the race. You had Lindsey Graham, who was one of the fiercest right. critics, right. who threw every single negative comment really at him. And threw a cell phone, literally. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, looking, you're talking about, again, someone who had totally different visions of the right. party, and now Lindsey Graham's viewed as one of Trump's closer allies. Right. So the parties kind of mold to around who's at the sure. top of the ticket and such. So again, ultimately, I think that's, that's the more likely end. But I remember doing an interview with Robert Costa of the Washington Post yeah. back in 2016. And I talked to him about the party. And he said, like, how the Republican Party, this was September, I think, of 2016. And how he said the party, Republican Party of Trump wins would never be the same. And I think it's a fact. And again, that's not saying mm -hmm. it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's 100% not the party where they could win suburban votes, really. Sure. Like we said, that pol political realignment we talked right. about last episode, that the Philly suburbs aren't going to necessarily run back to Trump. He still is going to have support there. There's right. no doubt. And Republicans can win there. Brian Fitzpatrick still in office right. there. And he will go in probably as the favorite, even if that district, Bucks County, is trending blue because sure. he more molds the district. But point being, there's definitely different visions in the party. And it, it's kind of interesting to see how it will continue to grow where we're, will all these Republicans who are viewed as never Trumpers, will they just leave the party? Right. Or are they going to try to hang tough and sure. maybe they'll agree with Trump when they want to, when they think is right, and they'll disagree when they see suited? Same thing with Democrats. Right. If, let's say, a Sanders was at the top of the ticket or a Biden or a Warren. Does the other side vote for him? Yeah, them? exactly. Do they, will, they, will they fall in line? Right. Will they say, you know what, it's, this is my party, i got to do what I have to do? Or are they going to say, you sure. know what, there are certain things that just don't sit right with sure. me? That'll be, again, something that'll be really interesting to follow. Yeah, and, and don't you see the same thing happen in, in different states? I mean, you look at the state of Pennsylvania, and you've got statewide Governor Tom Wolf, his lieutenant governor, John Fetterman, is self self-described socialist. And then you've got uh, Attorney General Josh Shapiro, and then the state auditor general who's now running for Congress, Eugene D. Pasquale. And you look at the three of them, and you would all say they, they represent some different aspect of the Democrat Party, yet they're all in the same party, yet they all represent a, a different brand of that. I mean, so, so we see this in smaller sections, cross-sections across the country, don't we? And I think Pennsylvania is like a great example of that, Sam, because there are certain states of the country you look at, like, you know, let's go polar opposites. You can look at a California sure. to like an Alabama, mm -hmm. Mississippi, whatever. You know, you could be the most flawed candidate being with an R or a D next mm -hmm. to your name and you're going to win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But guess what? In Pennsylvania, candidates and visions, I think, matter. Yeah. It's, even though Trump was the first to win the state as a Republican presidential uh, mm -hmm. candidate since 1988, if you look at the statewide elections, it seems seemingly flips back and forth yeah. to 
you know, before Tom Wolf, it was uh, Tom Corden, who was a Republican. Before him, it was Ed Rendell, right. a Democrat. Before him, I think it was a Republican and, yeah. uh, what was it? It's Tom uh, Ridge and then Mark Schweiker. Yeah, Schweiker, yeah. yeah, correct. So you're talking about, it's kind of flip-flopped in Senate. We've had a split delegation yep. Yep. for some time. You know, you've had Bob Casey's been in the U.S. Senate since 2000. He was elected in 2006. Yep. He's there to this day. He's a Democrat. We've had Republicans. Uh, Toomey got first elected in 2010. Mm -hmm. So looking at 10 years of split. So Pennsylvania is a great example of the country where there's yeah. different ideas in these parties. There's, you have these pro-Trump Republicans in certain areas of the state. Right. And you have the Republicans that are like the Fitzpatrick mold sure. that are... Uh, not in love with right. that idea. And there's the Democrats in the state, and let's look at Philly, where I'm from. You have Philly, where you have uh, more liberal elected officials. Mm -hmm. You have a district attorney like Larry Krasner. Sure. Um, Who's not a Bob Casey type at all, no, or even and, a Josh Shapiro yeah, type. Right? And Jim Kenney. Well, I mean, Krasner and uh, Shapiro have had public disagreements that have been well mm -hmm. documented by a lot of outlets. So it's, and even though they're in the same party, they're, they don't share exactly the same vision. So Pennsylvania is a great example of you make a two-hour drive one direction to the other, you will see the definition of what a Democrat means to their local level or a Republican means sure. to their lo local level is totally different. Imagine, you know, a Philly Republican and a Republican from Lycoming County. Right. Certainly do not <laughs> doubt they have a ton in common, really. Right. You know, I mean, the name ID might be there, but for the most part, there's different visions right. there. And I think Pennsylvania is so important in this next election because... You try to, you know, I think Pennsylvania more than other states, it, it's a key state to win. Electoral votes matter here. Mm -hmm. And there's a good amount of people, I think, that are independent-minded. Or sure. Maybe, you know, to outsiders, they may view one as a quote-unquote conservative Democrat yeah. and maybe some as a liberal Republican. Right. Point being, you have those that are, like, willing to vote for the other party, the right. swing counties. Sure. Pennsylvania has more of that than a lot of the country. Sure. And it will be interesting to see how they're able to appeal to those people. You think in this state, or, or in other states too, the swing, that swing vote is more likely to come into play, that, that people are more likely to swing if their party doesn't go with a candidate more of their liking. I think absolutely. Or versus a break apart into four more parties. You yeah, think it's more yeah. likely to swing? Yeah, I think they'll, they'll swing the other way. I mean, just quickly on a local level, we've seen... Um, uh, not local, but in Pennsylvania, you had uh, State Senator John Udichak. Yeah. He uh, was a Democrat in um, Luzerne County, switched Switch parties to sure. Independent. Sure. Um, again, in that region of the state, momentum right. has basically gone towards Republicans. Sure. Um, but even, even, Je even Congressman Jeff Van Drew in New Jersey yeah, made South that party Jersey. switch. Yeah. Exactly. And it's interesting that you've seen people where they don't feel they're at home there. But having said that, in Pennsylvania, you have, it's such a, it's a big state, different ideas, different corners of the state. And ultimately, I think, you know, they'll, I think, there's a chance if they don't like the person at the top of the ticket, they might vote otherwise. There's probably a good amount of registered Republicans in the Philly suburbs that don't like Trump. And if there's a Democrat, yeah. they can quote maybe stomach. Sure, they'll vote, they'll for, vote them, for them. Yeah. And there's probably Demo there's sure. definitely Democrats in the state. If there's someone yeah. someone at the top of the ticket, they think, oh, I don't really align right. with that person. I'll right. maybe suck it up and vote third party or Even vote for the Trump. Tr the Trump Democrats are the state. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, exactly. Absolutely. That's a great breakdown, John. Thank you for that. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. John, thanks again for, for really just helping us talk through what's going to happen this year. It's going to be an exciting year to follow as we continue to chat through the year. Uh, one of the things is, I think it's become a tradition when you're on this show, <laughs> is we talk about our favorite college football coach, Matt Rule, played at Penn State, coached at your alma mater, Temple, so, or my alma mater, Baylor, stole him. Uh, and, and we've had these great conversations about him. Well, Coach Rule is on the move again. He's now in the NFL head coach of the Carolina Panthers. Uh, let's talk about that. Your thoughts on that pick uh, for the Panthers. And by the way, um, this was not planned that both of our ties are kind of uh, closer uh, to um, Carolina uh, Panthers colors, by the way. That is not <laughs> planned at all. But um, no, it was, uh, I remember talking months ago uh, when he first was hired by Baylor. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a fantastic hire. I was at school when he announced. Right. I was a senior at Temple, uh, probably a couple of months away mm -hmm. from graduation when he announced. And I, no hard feelings, I understood that he was going to a better program, a better situation, although Baylor was in a different spot because different of the, spot. The, the scandals. Well, Absolutely. point being, he did a phenomenal job there. I believe, what was it, like 2-10 to 6-6 six and six yeah, to 10-2? 1-11 to 11-1. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and that's yeah. talk about a turnaround. And his name was floated around for quite a while mm -hmm. as being interested in the head coaching job. And uh, when the off, you know, when uh, the regular season ended, kept hearing his name surface, and I'm happy that's not the NFC East. <laughs> so you're happy he's not the Giants. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I would have been. And he, you know what's funny? One of Rule's old stops was he was. Uh, one he of was the, at New York. He right? was in New York. Yeah. He was under uh, Tom Coughlin right. for a period of time. I forget he had one of the smaller uh, yep. 
roles there. But the funny thing is, he was there, and there was rumors that he was going to go. Well, New York was supposed to interview him the next day. Mm-hmm. And Carolina said, we don't even want you to get on the airplane. And they, and they signed a multi-year deal yes. with Rule. They're really investing, yeah. and they're placing a lot of faith in him. Mm-hmm. I think he's a fantastic coach. Uh, but the one thing that is noteworthy, you know, that leap from college to pro isn't this easy, seamless transition. Right. A lot of guys try and fail. Right. And, I mean, for Philadelphia uh, fans, we will never uh, forget. Uh, Chip Kelly had that. You know, he was <laughs> right. uh, great in Oregon, and right. you know, when he came to Philly, he was not successful sure. whatsoever. And then others like Pete Carroll. And, and had, Pete Carroll is a super. Well. Yeah. And Pete or, Carroll. Yeah, and or Harbaugh. It, no, that's funny. You have two sides of you know the same coin. Where um, there's some that excel, mm-hmm. some that don't. I'm rooting for rule. So put this out way though. You know, when the Eagles are not, if there's a year the Eagles are eliminated. Rules the first one I'll be rooting sure. for, but hopefully you know uh, he does. As long as he loses, he can win every other game except the Eagles. Except the Eagles. Other than that, that's fine by yeah. me. I'm with you. I'm with you. I think <laughs> Matt Rule is a great guy, a great coach, does it the right way. I'm mm-hmm. uh, really, really excited to see what he does in Carolina. Yeah, they, they got a great coach there. Happy yeah, for them. Absolutely agree. So that is all the time we have today. My thanks to John Cole for breaking down the election as well as Matt Rule's new hire uh, for us today. Tune in again next week as we break down another issue. My name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.